<laughs> All right, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. But okay, Susanna, should I ask the question that I asked during our yearbook meeting yesterday? I'm so sorry. Are... Okay, so, so Susan, oh, wait, now I can't remember what your choice was. The question is, who is your favorite Spider-Man actor to our panelists? So I, being of a certain generation, clearly <laughs> impartial to Tobey Maguire. <laughs> Just top notch, top notch. Uh, I love it. Susanna, who was your choice? I said Tom Holland. You said I Tom Holland? Seen, I haven't seen all of the, the Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield ones, so that's part Gasp. of it. Gasp. Gasp. Horror. <laughs> Are you sure you're fit to be the mediator here, Susanna? If that's a great question. All I'm, the no, I'm sorry. People? I'm just not a millennial, so it's like... It has nothing to do with being a millennial. Uh, yeah, the, is... If millennial means you have good taste. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bernard, how about you? I think I think um, Toby Maguire played a good Peter Parker. Andrew Garfield played a good Spider Man, and Tom Holland played both together. So I think Tom Holland. I, I, wait a minute. That's literally what uh, somebody said yesterday, word for word. Dominique think, Grimes said that yesterday. I think there's a point to it. Because, Very good. Yeah, they I love they that. Uh, they all have different qualities, but yeah. Tom Holland encompassed everybody. Oh, that's that's interesting. Okay, I'll say that as a vote for Tom Holland. So, Joe, how about yourself? Well, I have to admit that um, despite being, by all accounts, a millennial, I also have not seen all of the uh, previous Spider Spider Men. Um, so he cast you seen... out into the abyss of Gen Z, Spidey's. yeah, where there's wailing yeah. and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, um, yeah no mercy. <laughs> I do feel like, I don't know. I, I think I actually prefer Andrew Garfield to Tobey Maguire. Tobey Maguire is just, I don't know, kind of <laughs> weird to me, you know? That is for sure true. He's, yeah, okay. If we can agree on that, then, then I'm okay. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't know how you could deny uh, having seen Spider-Man 3 that he is the, the strangest one. Uh, welcome, Alexis. Welcome, Matthew. So we're, we're asking icebreaker question while we wait uh, to see if our last panelist will join us. Who is your favorite Spider-Man of the most common Spider-Man? Oh, and Sharon's here too. So Matthew, I'll start with you. <laughs> Who's your favorite Spider-Man? Toby Maguire, Tom Holland, Andrew Garfield, or or Miles Morales? Um, let's see here. Well, given that I've only seen the Toby Maguire Spider-Man um, so far, you know, I, I can't really provide much. I just yes, yeah, so oh. either of the others. Don't go any further. The best ones. Although, although I, I like the other ones too. <laughs> Alexis, how about you? I haven't seen him either. <gasps> so I like Toby McGuire, I guess. See. So that's good. Go it's a, it's a vote by default. The classic. Yeah. He really <laughs> is. All right, Sharon, we're asking a little icebreaker question. Welcome. So glad you're able to make it. Do you have a favorite Spider-Man actor? Well, clearly the correct answer is Tobey Maguire. Oh, it is. It is. My answer. <laughs> all right. Awesome. Well, I think we've got everyone here, so let's get started. Um, thank you to I all think the before, attendees. Before the next webinar, Chris, you should send out a list of requirements for all the panelists and and have these kind of... Yeah. I'm not going to accept anyone like, else who, right. who isn't a Tobey Maguire fan next right. time, actually. <laughs> I guess this will be my last one. I am sorry, Susanna. <laughs> we have to kick you out. <laughs> All right, well, let's start off with a prayer and I will introduce everyone and we'll get uh, started. Oh, tossed over to Susanna. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Amen. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Mother of Divine Grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. I realized I should have looked up who is the, the patron saint of mathematics. I know St. Matthew is the patron saint of accounting. Accounting and taxes. Yep. Taxes. I'm sure, Alexis, do you know the patron saint of architects? Um, it's St. Saint, Saint Barbara. Oh, I love Which that. Is, yeah. Uh, Sharon, is there a patron saint of engineers? No. <laughs> <laughs> they're all too task oriented all right okay well thank you all for coming um this is we took a little bit of a break over christmas i hope you guys all had a very lovely time uh and uh, are having a very happy 2023 uh 
we are here for our next iteration of our uh, career webinar series, uh, where we talk to members of the MODG community, alumni, teachers, consultants, staff who have worked in the various fields and have experience uh, to help our students understand what they might be looking for and preparing for uh, as they pursue different degrees. Uh, so I'll introduce, uh, starting with Mrs. Sharon Williams. Thank you so much for being here today, Sharon. Sharon is going to be speaking to us today about engineering. She has her Bachelor's of Industrial and Systems Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, GIT. She previously worked for Beach Aircraft and Motorola and used to be a teacher for Mother Divine Grace School, teaching everything from religion to math and grammar, history, and has been a homeschooling mom for over eight years. And she is currently still an MODG consultant. What this year, 13, 14, 15 years, Sharon? Uh, I lose count. I know that's 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 the best, the, the sign of a good job. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. Then we have Mr. Bernard Michael, uh, who will be talking with us today about finance and accounting. Uh, Mr. Michael has his uh, bachelor's in accounting from Cal State University at San Bernardino and also has his master's in public administration from that institution. He previously interned with the Economic Development Agency for the County of San Bernardino, helping people transition between and into employment opportunities. And he is the MODG finance manager. And we are very grateful to have him both at our school and here with us today. Uh, next up, we have another MODG employee, uh, Joseph Montanaro. He is uh, was speaking with us today about IT, and he is a systems engineer for Mother Divine Grace. Uh, he is an MODG alumnus, uh, class of 20, 2010, although I think I was the class ahead of you, but we did a lot of classes together. Uh, Joe has his bachelor's from Thomas Aquinas College, and he has worked for MODG in IT since 2014, working a lot on backend infrastructure, helping with our websites, and is our primary point of uh, contact for IT escalation. So thanks so much for being with us today, Joe. Uh, next, we have Miss Alexis Stipa, who will be speaking with us today about architecture, also an MODG alumna, a class of 2012. Uh, Alexis is from Arizona, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, she graduated from Ave Marie University studying math and humanities, and then received her master's in architecture at Notre Dame, brought her all around the world, has worked with a lot of excellent architects, uh, including Duncan Stroik, who I know him most for doing the Thomas Aquinas College Chapel, of which I have spent many an hour. Um, and she currently is working for Harrison Design in Santa Barbara. I was just uh, talking last night with uh, Bill Hull, one of your colleagues. We, we had dinner together. I had no idea that you guys worked together. I should have known that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and she also manages the Elizabeth House in Santa Barbara, which is a super cool project. We've shared about it on our, on our social media. Um, and if we have time, we'll talk about that as well. So thanks so much for being here, Alexis. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Matthew Ganahl, also an MODG alumnus, uh, class of 2021, and he was one of our class speakers for that year. Uh, he is a current student at University of Notre Dame, looking to get his undergraduates in physics and biochemistry. Uh, so we have, a, as, we, as you can see, a wide range of topics and experience. So without further ado, I will toss it over to Ms. Susanna Cope, our NHS chapter secretary, who you all know and love dearly, uh, and take it away. Susanna. Awesome, thank you so much. We'll go ahead and get started with a prayer. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Mother of divine grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so to start us off with the topic of engineering, um, Mrs. Williams, could you please tell us a little bit about what originally sparked your interest in engineering and about your work in the field prior to working for Modge? Uh, so I'm a little nervous about this question. I fell into engineering almost by accident. I was the first person in my family to go to college, so we didn't know really anything about what kind of careers were available, but I was always enjoyed math and science. That's what I was on math team and had a talent for that. And my guidance counselor told me that I should be an engineer. So that's all I had. So it really was a grace that led me to that. But um, I, I enjoyed, I like the hard sciences, you know, I like getting the right answer. Like when I do a problem, right, the right answer. And 
it really wasn't until I was an adult that I understood the importance of making a good argument or writing a good paper. That all just was foreign to me. So I liked it. I was good at it. I enjoyed the people that were attracted to that kind of thing. I liked being with them. And um, so I just kind of fell into it. And then once I was doing it, I realized that I really enjoy the kind of problems you encounter in that in that work. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. What was, could you explain a little bit about um, the different types of jobs or types of engineering yeah. that you did before being a consultant? Right. So uh, among engineers, uh, the kind that I do is not, uh, it's considered a little bit soft, but really where I worked is the integration of people and design. So um, I worked in, in a couple ways in, for beach aircraft, we had aircraft manufacturing and we were designing a paperless system so that the FAA requires file boxes full of files for every single airplane that's made and every single part that's made is a lot of data that it has to keep up with. And people were writing these out on tickets. And so we designed a system so that the person can interface and scan the part and you know, all these barcodes that we use, we take for granted, someone designed the system behind that. So I was des designing the system behind that, which was really fun. You had to think carefully about all how people interacted with what they were manufacturing and then what data the FAA required and then putting that together. And then for Motorola, um, and this, I'm gonna sound like a dinosaur, but we were bringing our first robot online. This was really exciting at, in, in my day. And um, the robot is more efficient. So you wanted to have the robot load more parts onto the little circuit board. But if you put too many parts on the robot, the whole line got jammed up and piles of inventory would be all over the place because they're all waiting on the robot. So to balance that line such that we made the best use of the robot, but still kept the product flowing through with schedules, I had to design all that and simulate it. So those are the kinds of problems that I solved in my engineering world. Oh, that's really fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. See. Mr. Michael, would you please tell us about your experience working in finance and accounting and what your favorite part is about working in the field? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, uh, I straight out of my bachelor's degree, I went into um, to, to do an internship with the county. And, um, and that lasted about eight months, uh, the internship program. Um, from there, I went on to work with uh, Catholic Charities uh, in San Bernardino. Uh, which was mostly uh, EFSB, Emergency Food and Shelter Program, um, which was basically restricted, unrestricted funds, allocating funds for um, for um, different needs that the county had. Um, and I've worked with a couple of uh, accounting firms that uh, worked with audits and taxes. Um, probably um, the, the most... Uh, degree oriented job was was when I worked with accounting uh, with accounting firms and they worked on audits, uh, payroll taxes, sales tax, um, financial statements, um, uh, one year audits, three year audits, uh, six year audits. And um, and I've also worked with a, a church, St. Joseph's down in Pomona uh, for um, uh, for the rectory over there. Uh, not as much finance and uh, accounting as uh, as the other institutions, but uh, definitely uh, impactful. Um, I think the favorite part uh, for me anyway was with my accounting degree, I was able to make a change and make an impact wherever I worked, uh, especially at, at places like St. Joseph or um, when I interned at the county. So, um, so I think that would be that would be the best part of this job. Yeah, yeah that's so awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. Mr. Montanaro, could you please explain what you do for Maj in IT and what you like best about it as well? Yeah, so I do, well, a lot of stuff because our IT department is very small, so there is a lot to be done, and we all end up doing a bit of everything, but I tend to focus more heavily on uh, what I would describe as infrastructure, so back-end uh, managing servers and web services and uh, tooling that we actually build for ourselves to streamline and automate some of the workflows that we uh, go through frequently. Um, so less, I spend less time on 
sort of the things that you as a user will see and interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and more time on things that are kind of happening in the background um, underlying all of that stuff. Um, sorry, what was the second part of your question again? Oh, just what you like best about it. Oh, yeah. Um, I would say I I like it for a variety of reasons. For one, I mean, I just think computers are cool. And so I'm really happy that I get to spend all day every day working on something that I think is cool. Um, but also, uh, similarly to how Mrs. Williams mentioned, uh, there's a real, real satisfaction in solving problems, you know, when, when something is uh, broken, or just not functioning well in some way, and you can make a difference there, and really improve um, the both the, the system and the lives of the people who have to use it. Uh, that's, that's really nice. And it also really helps that, you know, I know that I'm contributing to something that's really worthwhile in the broader sense. I mean, I love, obviously, the school and what we do. And it's really nice that I can spend time doing what I love and know that it contributes to something that's really good instead of contributing to, you know, tracking people for advertising dollars or that sort of thing. No, that sounds like the best case scenario. Thank you so much. All right, Ms. Stipa, could you tell us what influenced your decision to further your undergraduate studies and study architecture and about your work experience after getting your master's? Yes. Um, so when I graduated from Ave, I had a humanities degree and my options were kind of teaching math or humanities and neither of those really were what I wanted to do. So I ended up visiting the School of Architecture and they had all their watercolor painting out and I just loved it. And I had looked through my sketchbooks and they were all different, um, you know, buildings that I had been painting. So I was like, oh, this could be, this could actually be a, a job and you can use, you know, math and, and all of the, uh, studying humanities is, is similar to, it's pretty much a liberal arts degree. And so studying all the history of ideas and um, it really goes hand in hand with, with buildings and, sort of studying all these different places and and how you know ideas influence the building so they, they kind of go hand in hand um so that's just been a really fun um thing to, to think to study think to think to get into as a profession um because you really do you know in your day-to-day -day designing different buildings you really do get into like oh this is a tuscan detail that the romans used and we're going to put it on you know a little chapel and we have to use an argument and it's very rational of why we can do this and um, not just stamp a design in the middle of nowhere. You have to have sort of a reason. And um, I found that my kind of critical thinking, um, math degree, humanities background really helped problem solving with the different architectural problems. So it's kind of like theory and then there's the practice. So I had gotten a lot of theory in my undergrad and then my graduate degree was a lot of practice. Yeah, that's so cool. Thank you. What what all have you done? Or maybe what was your like favorite project that you've worked on as an architect? Um, so at, at Harrison, we have a bunch of different uh, churches going on right now. And that's been really fun because I, I really uh, hate ugly churches. So it's been neat to go in and kind of work with the priest as a client and say, okay, you, you know, your budget's this, this, and this, we can do this and, and kind of get creative and um, look at ways to make uh, sacred space is beautiful. That's something I really love doing. Uh, but you know, even just houses and and making places a beautiful um, place to live is just it's a really rewarding experience. It's kind of painful because there's a lot of details and you know a lot of work that goes into it. But um, I don't know. I just it's always really inspiring to see how happy people are after and then how it influences people as well. Yeah, that's so beautiful and so needed too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Ganal, could you tell us what originally drew you to study physics and biochemistry and what you're planning to do with those degrees after college? So, well, first, first sorry for the for the background noise. I didn't uh, think this place would be so loud. I needed a place that was fairly near to my next class. But anyway, um, I hope it's not too much of a problem. Yeah, so the reason I chose physics and biochemistry um, well, for one thing, like I've, I've always, I've always liked science. Um, 
anybody that is, you know, the, the natural sciences. I've, I've always kind of really enjoyed learning the, the way the world, you know, the physical world kind of really operates. Um, and I've always been, I, I, you know, I've always, you know, felt that I was, I was fairly good at it. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so, and so I, I figured, you know, you know, I'll, 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 I'll go study, you know, some, something science in college, right? Um, and as, as time went on, I was like, okay, you know, physics sounds, you know, physics is kind of, kind of you know, very much kind of fundamental. Um, it was kind of going down to the, the basics of the, of the scientists, or so of the sciences. Uh, and, so I, and so I thought, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll go study physics. Um, and then actually in MODG biology, um, we read uh, excerpts of um, Darwin's black box. Um, and I was, I was very interested by that book. And so I, I read like a little bit further into it. Um, and I learned about, you know, the, the molecular biology field. Um, so I was hoping to do study, studies like physics uh, and, then, and then molecular biology. Um, I mean, so Notre Dame didn't have a molecular biology degree, but biochemistry is, is pretty close, I think. So, so that's my, uh, that was kind of what drew me to, to study those. Um, but one of the things like kind of what, what I, I don't know, many reasons have come up, I think, like since I started that I'm, that I'm feeling like the place is a good fit. So, um, I mean, first of all, you know, I, you know, I have like a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, great, you know, Catholic friends and they're, you know, a lot of them are, you know, like in the in, kind of in the humanities department, um, you know, they study political science or theology or whatever, all of which I absolutely love. Um, but sometimes I feel like there's a little bit of a dearth of, you know, um, Catholics in the in the STEM fields, and so, uh, and so I, I think that's you know a, good, a very good reason for me to, for me to keep with it, um, kind of like for a, you know sort of an apostolate oriented reason perhaps. Um, but yeah, as, as to what I do want to do with them after college, uh, the first thing is whenever whenever somebody hears that I'm studying biochemistry, the first thing they ask is, "Oh, are you planning to go to medical school?" Um, and I always say no um, because, uh, to be honest, I don't really know. Um, what I want to do job-wise with um, my degrees after college. Um, it's for, for now, it's mainly just, as I said, like I, I just really enjoy you know, like learning the sciences. So right now, like I'm, I'm studying them. And for me, the biggest thing about my, my degrees is it's not so much the degrees, it's just like the subjects. I love studying them. Um, there are like a lot of job opportunities that I think come, come with, you know, you know, kind of a STEM heavy degree. Um, and I think that's a, that's, that's kind of a nice bonus, I think, in, in, in my eyes. But yeah, um, the main thing is for now is just kind of, you know, lear learning. Um, some things that like I, I have thought about, um, you know, that I, that I could do after college um, would be, um, I don't know, like so some, some jobs that I, you know, could see myself doing would just be some, something in research, um, whatever, whatever that might be, whether it's like physics or biochemistry or teaching. Teaching is something that I've also I wanted to do. Um, uh, but the other thing, aside from like jobs, I, I also want to go to graduate school. But at this point, like I really have no idea what I want to do that. And because, you know, as I said, like I like, you know, science, but I also love the humanities. So I could easily, you know, uh, I, I could easily, you know, try to go to graduate school and, and say like philosophy or something. Something that appeals to me right now it, a lot is like philosophy of science. So I'd kind of be integrating the two. But yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's the answer. Yeah, that's so cool. Thank you so much. All right, jumping back to engineering, Mrs. Williams, what was your favorite part about working in the field of engineering? And were there any unforeseen circumstances where your faith tied into your career at all? Uh, so uh, tell me the first part again. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Just what is your favorite part about working in the field? So what surprised me about engineering, so, you know, I went into it really not knowing what it was. And then when I got there and as I worked, I realized the part that I like most is that it requires creativity. So anyone can solve a math problem with just numbers. But when you put people into the equation, finding an elegant solution, a creative solution, the whole idea of creating something new was the most exciting. That's what I enjoyed more than anything else. And it surprised me because it's sort of common to all engineering, whether you're designing a space station or you're designing a manufacturing line or you're designing a wheel, you're making something new and you have to think about all the, all the factors and rank them. Sometimes there's trade-offs, right? You have two things and you can't have them both. So you have to decide which excellence you want. So that 
whole ability to sort of think of all the options and choose the best one was what I really enjoyed. In terms of my faith, um, I would say that, uh, so it wasn't called STEM back when I did it. I was just engineering. I was, but I think there is a tendency to treat people as though they're just um, machines with flesh, right? A man can do these things. And I think it's sort of a constant challenge to remember that these are people, that, that their worth is beyond value. And so the systems that you build for them or the problems that you solve for them have to consider that they're not just capable of lifting 10 pounds or capable of sitting in this chair or clicking these buttons, but that they're real people with souls. And um, when you start losing track of that is when you really run into trouble. So I think bringing the humanity, and I, I'm going to say it, um, I think a, a woman is a little more, it comes to us more naturally that way to, to see that because raising children kind of, we're just sort of made for that a little bit better. I think that's one thing that I would always be, I would be the one advocating for the person in the team. And not that the others weren't open to it. They just didn't always see it as clearly as I did. So that's where I think the faith is most valuable, at least in the work that I did. Not Maybe there were other opportunities um, that I didn't encounter, but that was the biggest one. Oh, thank you. That's so beautiful mm -hmm. to look at it with that, like, basically pro-life perspective. So, thank you. All right, jumping back to finance, Mr. Michael, what would you say is the hardest thing about working in accounting and finance? And was there anything that you didn't originally expect? Yeah, I, uh, that, that's a that's a good question. Uh, and uh, not a lot of people talk about this in, uh, in in college when when you're getting your degree, but it's it's tied up. It's tied into both uh, hardest thing and, and something I didn't expect would would probably be not all organizations have um, paperwork that is accurate, uh, nor are they as organized as they should be. Uh, I think that was one of the challenges uh, from working in audit firms and doing audits with different um, uh, nonprofits, uh, sole proprietorships, uh, small businesses, basically, uh, when we asked them, oh, could you give us you know, records from the last six years? Uh, there, was, there were instances where they were still handwriting all their financial statements. And uh, it, they used the old, uh, these old blue ledgers that were a thousand pages, and uh, each ledger had half a year's worth of information from uh, 20 years ago. So we had 20 years worth of ledgers that we had to review and check up on receipts and, um, and look at the background of purchase orders and invoices and things like that. So I think uh, that would be one of the hardest things for anyone working in accounting or finance, just to have information readily available, which just makes the job a lot easier. But if you are a firm that believes in only having paper copies, it's a little tougher. So I think that would be something that I didn't expect this day and age where everything is electronic and everything's available with you know a click of a button. Uh, I didn't expect a whole lot of paper trifling and going through um, receipts from 10 years ago or five years ago. So I think uh, that that was one of the, the hardest things working with uh, accounting or finance. Yeah, that's really insightful. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Mr. Montanaro, what would you say, I know you talked a little bit about this earlier, but what would you say is like the most rewarding um, thing about your career and what would you say is the most important? I actually have a, a comic for this. Let's see if I can get the um, region to, hold on, it's not giving. We're on the edge of our seat. What gives feelings of? <laughs> I 
And actually, while he's getting that up, I just wanted to remind you guys that we do have a Q&A pod, so feel free to put questions in there. Um, we should have a little bit of time for those at the end or to throw them in the chat box as well. Sorry about that. I'm not sure exactly what happened. Zoom just crashed on me. Oh, um, no. <laughs> just goes to show you that no one is immune. But um, my, I was just going to say, it's uh, there, there are a lot of things that I uh, find rewarding about my career, but um, one of the smaller ones, sort of less important, is it's kind of fun to be regarded as a sort of a wizard. You know, there's a, if you've ever used the um, the terminal or the, the command line, which is, you know, you may have seen it in uh, movies or whatever. It's just that screen of text where you, you type in some text and it gives you more text and you're sort of speaking directly to the computer. Anytime you do that in front of someone who doesn't have experience doing it themselves, they they look at you like you're some sort of uh, deep mystic who has communed with the ancient gods or something. And that's kind of fun. Um, but that's obviously a minor thing. I would say more importantly, well, what I talked about it at first was um, just the, the import of what you do and, and solving problems. Um, but I'm, I'm going to say for on a different uh, sort of note, what what can be really important to uh, to the career itself is you really have to keep an open mind because IT is an especially fast moving field. Um, things are changing all the time, and it's very easy to find something that works well enough and then just kind of stick with that, even if better solutions might be becoming available as time goes on. So you can't just kind of staying up to date and uh, being aware of what's out there is a really important. Yeah, this is what I was trying to share. Um, just, you know, it's a, it's funny, but it's kind of true. I have oh, to yeah. say, as somebody who has had uh, Mr. Montanaro do this to me many times, um, I feel very inferior and it definitely gives him a lot of power over me. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's really the main reason, actually, to go into IT. No, oh, thank you so much. That's both of those are very good to know. <laughs> uh, let's see, jumping back to Sorry, Susanna, um, do you, are we going to answer the questions at the end? Is that the intention? Um, yes, usually we okay. have a few minutes for Q&A at the okay, end. Perfect. perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's see, Ms. Daiba, what was your favorite or what is your favorite part about your career and what was your experience like traveling around the world because of architecture? Um, I think one of my favorite parts is uh, the hand drawing in the beginning when you're, you're kind of learning, figuring out what, what the client wants. Um, it's this initial stages and you do a lot of sketching and there's a lot of brainstorming. Um, I love that. I love to draw and I love to like work with my hands. So that's one of my favorite parts. Um, and then as far as, as traveling, it was, it was really neat. Um, I don't know. I love, I love seeing how different cultures do, um, different regional things and how they build locally. So like we went to Cuba and it was a lot of Spanish influence and a lot of, um, just bright colors and a lot of history and, and a lot of pain in the people. Like you, you really see the history of a place over time. And um, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, we studied in Italy, which is, has the best churches, I think. <laughs> um, so just learning from, you know, seeing things in person, sketching them and, um, and, and to just learning. I think a lot of traveling is very, um, sort of Instagrammy and um, pop culture-y and, and kind of a like a very cultural, I don't know, sort of thing that people do lately that without seeing what what you're actually going to see, like there's, you, you travel without seeing and I don't, that sounds kind of funny, but um, what I mean is just when you have sort of a goal when you travel, like, oh, I want to, I want to get to understand how people build this in this region. It, it gives you a different perspective and, and you're not just there to take a picture, but you have kind of a mission and you talk to people and you learn um, how, you know, I don't know, just sitting with different families and seeing, oh, this is very similar to my family, only, you know, they're doing this and 
you know, the way they have their dishwasher up here is better and we can do that in the U.S. Kind of taking the good things from that and thinking about how you can bring them home is, is something I really, really enjoy. Um, so I think, I think a lot of people travel without actually getting into what a culture is about, um, not seeing the religion and the politics and the family structure and all the different dynamics that go into it. You know, you don't, you don't really, it was, it was really neat to go and, and do that and see um, with a sort of three-dimensional perspective, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's really beautiful and insightful. Thank you for sharing that. Let's see. All right, Mr. Ganal, what would you say if if you're able to narrow it down, like the number one thing that you learned from Maj that helped you to be prepared for college? And then just a little bit about your college experience at Notre Dame as well. But yeah, so um there's a that's here. Yeah, so so I as you guys the number one thing. Um if, you know, if I'm allowed to use kind of a, an umbrella term to cover as many things as possible, um, I would say it, you know, it, it gives a sense of like the human person, and the human purpose. It's, um, you know, especially going into STEM, um, you know, I find that, you know, there, there are a lot of people that are looking for a great career and great careers, you know, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing to have. It's, you know, very, very helpful for living a, a, you know, a good life, right? Um, and, you know, there are lots of people looking for all sorts of different things. Um, but, you know, it's like often, you know, I, I feel like um, MODG gave me a sense of, you know, not only how to do something, but what to do with it. Um, and it gave me a sense for, you know, lots of lots more things. So, you know, for instance, like, why, why am I studying this? It's because I love to study it, right? Um, and, you know, I, I have kind of gained a sense, I think, from MODG. Um, that, you know, like knowledge, you know, just kind of an appreciation of knowledge of, of you know, the, the, the world, broadly speaking. Um, and yeah, so, so kind of lots of similar things like that. And, and of course, um, you know, like a, a firm grounding, you know, in, in the faith from, from religion classes and whatever. So, yeah, I think it's just given me like a lot of, you know, it kind of gives me a, the, the whole picture. It's given me, you know, a, a great big view of, you know, what, what I should be doing. Um, yeah, what, what I can be doing in college. Um, let's see, as to college experience, let's see, how, how, do I, how do I put this briefly? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I can say it's been good overall. Um, so uh, at least like moving from MODG to, uh, to Notre Dame, um, it, I mean, it's, it, it was certainly an adjustment, and it was, it was a big adjustment in many ways, but it was a very, it was a very different adjustment, I feel, than many other um, of my, my peers in Notre Dame had. Um, for instance, especially in terms of, like, uh, like, class, uh, you know, like, kind of the this class schedule, because, you know, the way, the way it works in MODG, where you have, you know, like a few, like, online classes a week, um, you know, at least if you're doing LS courses, and then, you know, most of the time you're studying on your own time, that's very much similar to college, um, whereas, you know, most kids who went to, like, private or public schools um, may, may have an excellent education, but they have, you know, kind of their days filled with classes, and so um, they're not so used to kind of, like, structure, structuring their own study time, so, I mean, that, that was, you know, that, that, you know, that's kind of been an easier part of the transition for me, um, yeah, but I would say, yeah, it's like, you know, my, my, my time at Notre Dame has been wonderful. Um, you know, I have I've made, you know, lots of friends. Um, uh, I've had, you know, great professors, good, good classes. And yeah, it's just like very, very good uh, learning culture. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, for the next little bit of questions before we go to Q&A, I just wanted to ask if you all had any like specific advice um, for students who are interested in going into your um, career. So to start with Mrs. Williams, what are a few tips that you'd give to students who want to become engineers and is there anything they can do in high school to prepare? Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm really glad. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ganahl, for your comments, because um, I think being in engineering, it can your peers around you can be very much sort of focused on getting the job that pays the big money someday and um, lose sight of learning and the delight of learning. So I would say, keep that in mind. But the one thing that was surprising to me because so many people are coming in, they were, they've always been coming into this field because the careers are well-paying and well-respected. 
the colleges tend to have what are called weeder courses where they there are certain courses that I mean, I had a college professor that said the purpose of this course is to fail 25 percent of you. And they kind of call out the people who aren't well suited for engineering. And that was very difficult for me to kind of realize that, that there's some competition. I can understand getting, you know, people who aren't suited for the career to weed them out. But there are in college, there will be courses that are really designed to kind of just pull out the bottom quarter. And it's very difficult to be in that. Knowing that that's what the game is, that that's what it's about is helpful. Okay, I need to do well. And as Mr. Ganahl said, I need to structure my study time and stay on top of things so that I can perform well is really important. And then the, the last thing I would say is the, very, the day I graduated from Georgia Tech, I knew I was missing something. So I didn't have the things that MODG has to offer their students. I had a typical public school education. And um, understanding the importance of philosophy and the importance of thinking through what's true is, is never, is, is always important that the technical degree builds on top of that foundation. And so our MODG students are really at an advantage that I didn't have. I'm doing it backwards. I'm getting it after the fact. So um, I would just say, you know, attend to your studies, develop those good habits. That's going to stand you in good stead anywhere. But particularly in engineering, there are going to be times when you just have to do the hard work to stay above that bottom 25%. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's definitely very helpful. All right, Mr. Michael, how about you? Any advice for people interested in accounting or finance? Yeah, of course. Um, I think I'm I'm similar to what uh, Mrs. Williams was saying in terms of uh, I didn't have a, a much background either, uh, and I went to a, a, I went to Cal State, uh, so it would it would definitely be helpful if. Uh, me going in as a freshman at Cal State would have the information that we are all able to provide for incoming freshmen or, or graduating high school seniors. Um, one thing that uh, everybody encourages to do at, um, at college is to get involved in professional organizations. Uh, we had what's called an accounting association uh, where it was um, all the accounting students would gather and exchange information with each other. Uh, we would have uh, things like meet the firms where uh, companies would come and set up booths um, one uh, day out of the year. And you could uh, walk around and talk to all the different companies over there. Uh, most of them were audit firms. Um, some of them were small businesses who had an accounting department and they were looking to hire interns or hire. Uh, graduating seniors. Um, so uh, uh, they had also um, Cal CPA, which is the state accounting uh, organization. So every state has its own um, CPA organization. So that's something that um, you guys could start getting involved in as soon as you get into college. Um, other things could be uh, talking to your professors. Um, when you're when you're getting to your, your uh, junior year, uh, you start looking into interns, internships. And, uh, and everybody uh, always wants to go to the paid internship. Don't always go to the paid internship. Go to the unpaid internships as well. Um, I had a chance to get an internship at the county administration office in San Bernardino, which, which was a great experience for me because it was, it was the first time that I had uh, what they call it a big boy job. So, you know, you, you get to work in, a, in an office and you have your own desk and uh, they give you a list of reports that they want you to work on. And then, you know, you type it up, you print it, you take it to your supervisor. Um, th those, kind of, those kind of jobs are, are super valuable in, in whatever field you may get into. But just having that experience of, of um, that internship was great. Um, so that, that helped me get a, a second internship um, over there, but I was working two jobs and doing an internship. So uh, it definitely helped uh, getting my, my feet wet in this, in the pool, in the accounting pool. And, um, and everything, every internship you have, every job you have is going to help you. So, uh, so I would say there's, there's a saying in, in finance, they, they say your network is your net worth. So it's, 
as as much as you use your degree and uh, the the information you get and the knowledge you have, it's also the people you know. So try to get in, as involved as you can with uh, uh, with everything in college. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's really great advice. So you're gonna jump to Mr. Sure. Ginal first because I know you have to go soon. But thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, just last question for you. Do you have any tips for high school juniors and seniors as they prepare for college or any specifically for physics and biochemistry? Yeah, so uh, just I guess a few key things. Um, one is, uh, I think just aim high. If you, you know, if you want to go into, you know, a, a STEM field, you know, aim, aim for kind of, you know, big schools. We need, you know, we, we need MOG students, we need, you know, Catholics, we need, you know, th these kinds of people in, you know, our, our big institutions. Um, so that, that's one thing. The second thing is um, schedule. Uh, just one of the one of the biggest things at college is scheduling. You, you, you know, keeping track of everything um, as you know, you know, as you have to work out, you know, your your meal times, your class times, your study time, different things like that. Um, a third thing is um, there's just like a lot of you know important skills you know from MODG. I mean, among them like scheduling and, and such um, that that are good that you should really hold on to. But one of those that I found you know great is is writing. Um, there's a joke among like STEM majors, but it came from somewhere. The joke is that like, we don't know how to write papers. Um, and it's, you know, it's so, you know, once in a while we'll get like a writing assignment. We have to explain how some, something works and everybody in the back was like, oh no, right. Um, and, and, and I'd like to think that, you know, I feel a little bit more comfortable with that than, you know, many of my peers because I'm used to, you know, my kind of the, the, way, of, the way of thinking, the way of writing um, that, uh, that I learned at MODG. Uh, and I think I had a fourth thing, but I forget what it was. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, th thanks so much for having me. No, thank you so much for coming and for sharing. Really helps a lot. All right. And then going back to Mr. Montanaro, what would you say to students who are interested in a career in the field of technology? My number one piece of advice would just be get out there and do something. You know, there's uh, IT is a very easy field to get into because the barrier to entry is almost non-existent. You know, all you need is a computer. Basically, that's it. The uh, most of the major programming languages, frameworks, uh, all the the technologies you'd be working with in real actual careers are all just available for free, and you can just get started on them. From usually they'll have their own like getting started guide online is just like download these things, run these commands open up your text editor and bam, you're you're off and running. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity to just dive right in and start uh, trying things out. And I would say that's really important because I've always found that I learn best by doing in this field. Um, I don't know if that's just me or if it's uh, something that is common to many people in the field. But I think I've talked to a few other people who've had a similar experience. So I think it's it's pretty common that you really start to understand things best when you're actually working with them. And um, that's really easy to do. So there's no reason not to do it. And it's also uh, a good way to get started because unlike uh, some fields, IT tends to care a little less about formal education than hands-on experience. Now, that's, that's not always true. There are definitely some um, particular careers or even particular companies who put a heavier emphasis on having something like a computer science degree. And there are some things you can get from a computer science degree that you won't get as easily from, from working hands-on. But I would say the majority of jobs that are out there in the field care primarily about hands-on experience. So if you have experience with something, um, that's a huge leg up. Um, so yeah, there's no reason not to just just get out there, find a project that interests you and uh, jump right in. Uh, and another thing I would say is don't be afraid to try a whole bunch of different things. You know, there are many, many subspecialties in IT and, um, you know, they're, they're very, very different. You could find yourself really interested in kind of backend infrastructure stuff like I'm doing, sort of server management uh, orchestration platforms like Kubernetes or uh, Nomad or whatever. Um, or you could find yourself really interested in front end stuff, working with 
uh, web tools, JavaScript, et cetera. Or you could uh, go into AI, big developing field there. It's not going to go away. Um, there are lots of different things, and they're all very, very different. So even if something doesn't, you don't find yourself really as interested as you thought you were in one thing, try something else. You might be surprised. Thank you so much. That's really helpful and good to know. Good to keep in mind. Um, last but certainly not least, Ms. Stipe, what would you say to students who are interested in architecture? Um, I think one of the most helpful things is just to spend time in an architecture office. If you know anyone, talk to them and really get a sense of the profession because typically, you know, you want to know what your day to day is like. You might have a lot of great projects, but if you're not someone that likes sitting at a desk all the time, it might not be the best fit. So really just spending time and talking to people who are in the profession, I think is was really helpful for me. Um, I was able to intern a few different times and get um, different flavors of, of the field and kind of understand uh, different directions you can go in. And, and that really helped me because it, it is a commitment. Um, I saw someone was talking about student loans and all of that. And you, you are kind of, you have to love it to do it. So um, it's good to good to see what it's like before you jump in, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. That's again, all the advice is super helpful. Um, very insightful as well. I'm gonna go ahead and toss it back to Mr. Sebastian for the Q&A, but thank you all so much for being with us today. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This was really insightful, really helpful. And I love hearing such uh, thoughtful answers from all of our panelists. Um, so, so keep it up because we've got some intense questions coming up here. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I'm gonna try to address these to particular people, but of course, if any of you feel like you've got something to, to add, uh, please just hop in. Um, so I'm going to address this one to uh, Jacob's question to Mr. Montanaro. Uh, this was already partially addressed by uh, Mrs. Williams and, and Mr. Ganal, uh, but his question is, how would one balance studying in a STEM field with attaining a liberal arts education? So, uh, Joe, obviously you have your, your bachelor's in liberal arts from, from TAC, uh, and you were speaking about this a little bit with regards to experience versus formal degrees. Uh, but what would you say to Jacob? I would say it's um, it's surprising how complementary the two can be, especially because the stereotype of liberal arts tends to be, oh, I got a liberal arts degree because I didn't want to work. Um, obviously, that's there are liberal arts degrees and liberal arts degrees. But I, I would say um, liberal arts is so named because it's the uh, the art of the free man right so it's it's not for the sake of anything else it's it's something that's simply good in itself but what's surprising about that is actually kind of comes back and turns out to be useful all over the place right it teaches you big picture thinking and sort of to look past the surface and find underlying principles kind of the the key components on which systems are built and hinge and that is extremely useful in any STEM field, I would say, being able to identify what's truly important and what's sort of superfluous uh, can be a, a big leg up on um, in a field where it can be easy to get lost in particulars. Love that. That's awesome. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Ms. Saipo was already addressing this question a little bit, so, but I'm going to particularly put it over to Mr. Bernard because you talk about the money. Uh, so it's a broad question from Mr. Mr. Oaks, uh, but what is the best way to deal with the cost of tuition and student loans in these kinds of fields? For me as a high school senior, it seems kind of overbearing. So what advice would you give to, to Mr. Oaks about that? Um, there, there's always uh, financial aid available for a, a lot of these colleges, um, especially for Cal State, which is a state university. Um, and another thing that also helps is student jobs and work study that's available on campus. Uh, so those are a couple of options that uh, a lot of people utilized um, during their time uh, in college. Um, paid or unpaid internships, you know, that, that comes and goes. Uh, depending on the kind of connections each school has with their alumni uh, or um, professors that they have that can connect them with jobs. Um, but uh, I would say scholarships 
are also available for a lot of the applicants. Um, and the accounting department had uh, specific scholarships for those that had higher than a 3.8 GPA merit-based mm -hmm. scholarship, um, which was a financial uh, scholarship as well. So, um, so I think just look into the options that uh, that each school has because uh, it varies depending on you know, where you apply and uh, yeah. your FAFSA application that goes in to the feds. And there's college um, admissions consultants that that can help you with that. Can, can I add to that, Chris? Please. So when I was in school, and a lot of STEM uh, degrees have this, they had co-ops where you went to school for a semester and then you work for a semester. And I resisted doing that because I didn't want to get out of track with my class. I couldn't have that idea. But the fact of the matter is once you get to college, um, at least when I was there, very few people graduated in the four years. It was very common mm -hmm. four and a half years. The distinction between freshman, sophomore, and junior class kind of became blurry. So if if finances are an issue, which they are for most people, mm -hmm. well, that's one reason to co-op. Actually, I think that's the biggest mistake I made was not co-oping because you get that valuable experience. And frankly, that experience translates to dollars in the workplace when you get your mm -hmm. first job. But if they pay you a nice, you can earn a pretty good salary as a co-op and you it delays your graduation about a year to a half a year, but you mm -hmm. graduate with all this experience and very little debt. So I, I would explore that option. I wish I had. That's great. That's really helpful. And going back to what a lot of people said is, it's good to study something for the joy of its own sake. And also you do have to love it if you want to end up working in the industry. <laughs> right, thank you both so much. All right, so this is addressed specifically to Ms. Dipe and Mrs. Williams. Uh, you both shared about entering a field that you did not anticipate. What advice would you give a high schooler who has no particular passion at this time? How do you cultivate interests while trying to maintain your school load? Uh, Ms. Saipa, would you want to start us off? Sure. It's a good question. Um, yeah, I think I think the best the best uh, advice I can give is just try to expose yourself to as many things as you're interested in. Um, if you watch a TV show and thought nursing was cool, go talk to some nurses, go go to the hospital and and walk around see if it's something you could do. I mean, I think one of my professors in college said that um, by junior year, you should figure out what you're gonna do um, after senior year. Now this is college, but um, you know, so thinking ahead, that's probably four years to really expose yourself to different paths and, and see what you're interested in. I think, yeah, as much exposure as you can and, and balancing the school load. One thing that I love about Mother Divine Grace is you can really adjust your schedule. You're not in a nine to five, you know, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. workload. Like I remember I would get up early, get my school done early and, you know, go ride my horse, <laughs> stuff like that. Love so, it. you know, you have you have a lot of flexibility that and, and a big advantage against other high schoolers because they're really locked into this, this schedule. Um, so if you can work ahead or, or, or stagger things to get that exposure, um, you know, you're you're kind of winning in a lot of ways so i would definitely you know any interest that you have you know explore it and and don't be afraid to ask people about what they do and and why and yeah especially the happy people don't ask the sad people <laughs> i've been loving how many smiles we have on this webinar so far it's great uh sharon did you have anything you wanted to add about that uh, yeah i would say um so i myself have been a ed engineer mom teacher um, I have my own quilting business. I'm now a real estate investor and professional. So um, I've changed jobs multiple times, but there are certain skills that every job needs. So the difference between an engineer and a really good engineer is communication. Mm -hmm. The difference between a, you know, a, a fill in the blank and a really good fill in the blank is someone who think crisply and clearly and can communicate well. So Developing those skills are going to stand you in good stead. And I would say have the confidence that God's going to reveal to you what he wants from you. And it may not be forever thing. You know, marriage is forever, but a job is not forever. So having, when I left engineering to raise my children, uh, a lot of people around me were just sort of filled with fear and give me advice about how I could get back into it. And I said, look, I'm making a career change and I'm perfectly capable of making another career change back into engineering later. So you don't lose your education, you don't lose your ability to think, and God will reveal those things 
to you. He doesn't usually tell you the 10th step. He just tells you the next one. So uh, those skills, though, that apply to everything are good communication and crisp thinking. You're always going to be in good shape if you develop those. Sharon, my mom calls it a uh, domestic engineer. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, her LinkedIn. She's a stay at home mom. But all yeah. those that's skills great. still apply. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's lovely. I'm going to use that in the future. All right, uh, <laughs> last question. You guys are fantastic. Um, and thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Uh, I'll, I'll address this to Mr. Montanaro. Would IT or computer science be a good degree for someone interested in STEM, but also wants to work from home in the future and have a good family slash work-life balance? I, I think probably. I mean, we're seeing in a lot of fields that remote work is becoming more widely, um, just more common. But I do think IT kind of has a leg up in that area because it's inherently something you do on a computer and it's often doesn't... It, really matter where you are because so much of it is just concerned with things that are already remote. Like, you know, the um, if you're managing a website, say, you're almost never going to be physically interacting with the machines that host that website. Those are always going to be in a data center somewhere. So it's already remote. Um, and as far as uh, being able to attain a work-life balance, I think it's another, another good um, candidate for that because, uh, well, I, I mean, it depends on the again, the particular subfield that you end up going into, but a lot of them are don't tend to be super uh, time critical. That is, you, you can arrange your schedule um, more freely than with some fields because they tend to focus less on uh, interacting with people and more with interacting with machines who will usually wait for you to get around to it. Not, of course, that interacting with people isn't also very important. It's just not as... Uh, you don't spend the majority of your time doing that, I would say. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, that's a great way to, to wrap it up. Uh, thank you all again for sharing your words of wisdom to our students. Uh, let's wrap it up with a prayer. Susanna, would you like to lead us? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And thank you all so much for coming. God bless you all. We'll see you next month. Thank you.